Well, good morning, everyone at home. This is the Lord's Day, and we have come to worship Him. I know you're in your house, and I'm here, but I'm going to invite you, as we begin this morning, to pray with me. Our God and our Creator, we open up your word that is true and that refreshes our soul, and we treasure it, Father. We thank you for revealing it to us, and we open it and read it today with reverence, understanding that these words come from you to give us hope and wisdom and instruction for our life. Heavenly Father, let the words of my lips and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Once again, good morning, everyone. The streets are empty and the hospitals are full. And the church is distributed into households. Experts don't know how long this is going to last or how bad it's going to get. And it's leaving a lot of us, as we've been talking about the last several weeks, feeling powerless and confused and frustrated and anxious. How should the people of God respond in times of crisis? I want to begin by saying that there are two extremes, there are two tendencies that we may have. And the first one is to offer explanations for why things are the way they are. And really, that's not our place to do that. It's not our place to explain what's happening and why, because we don't always have the answers why. And while we can view our current crisis through a proper biblical framework, and we can learn some lessons on, you know, along the way, which is what we tried to do last week, we've got to resist this temptation to decode current events, to, to discern something that God really hasn't revealed to us. It's kind of a dangerous game. It's presumptuous to do so. And if we do it, it will end up you know, with some kind of bogus, quasi-biblical interpretation of current events. But the other tendency of people of faith during this time is to downplay the darkness. And what I mean by that is to, to sort of gloss over the suffering and the evil that's at work in the world right now by saying things like, yeah, you know, bad things happen like, like they are today, but everything's going to turn out okay in the end. After all, you know, we believe that Jesus is going to return and he's going to judge the world in righteousness. There's going to be a resurrection, a new heavens and a new earth. So we shouldn't worry about this present darkness. While that is, is what we tell ourselves to soothe our conscience in times of darkness, it will be okay someday. It will be okay someday. While that's true for those in Christ, that it will be okay someday, that doesn't address the issue of pain practically now. Like, what do I do with my anxiety now? What do I do in this present darkness now? At home, uh, I'm reading The Hobbit to Simon and Nora every night. And if you've read that book, you know that um, Bilbo Baggins is getting in all sorts of trouble, out of the frying pan, into the fire. There are plenty of moments of darkness in that book, sometimes literal darkness. We just got past the point where Bilbo and his dwarf friends uh, finally get out of the forest of Mirkwood, a place of darkness where the canopy of trees is so thick that you can't really tell uh, night from day. And I found myself, while we're reading through that chapter, the kids are asking, what's going to happen? Are they going to die? Are they ever going to get out? And I found myself having to reassure them and say, yeah, you know, I've read this book, and it actually turns out okay. There is a happy ending. And we, we do need that assurance. But how do you speak that future hope 
into a person's life who's suffering now without cheapening their suffering, without trivializing their pain. You know, to someone who's suffering or who, who's, who's caring for a loved one who's suffering, and, and just to say, hey, don't worry about that, everything is going to turn out okay in the end, that comes off as very hollow, very trite, very unmerciful. And I've actually heard some very shallow expositions of the book of Job that basically do that. You know, sure, Job lost everything. Yeah, we've read Job chapter 1. He lost his livelihood, and he lost his family, and he lost his health, and that's all terrible. But have you read chapter 42? Everything turns out okay in the end. He's got loads of donkeys and camels, and he's got three beautiful daughters. What more do you want? Well, if that's the way we're supposed to read the book of Job, then why did God give us 40 chapters in between? What are we supposed to do with, with those chapters where Job is, is wrestling with his grief, where he's answering arguments, where he's trying to hold on to his integrity as his well-meaning friends are accusing him? That's a bit like saying, we don't need to worry about Jesus' suffering. We don't need to worry about Jesus praying in anguish in the garden. We don't need to worry about the shame of, of, you know, the crucifixion and his death and his burial. After all, he was raised from the dead. Well, that's missing it by a long shot, isn't it? When people are suffering, and people are, people are in hospital beds and they can't, they can't breathe, and their family can't be with them to hold their hand and to kiss them on the forehead, and to pray with them, and give them comfort. And people are passing away, and we can't even properly grieve over them because we can't have a proper funeral. When people are suffering, we can't respond simply with talk of happy endings in a way that, that invalidates their, their sorrow. Rather, what we, what we do as the people of God is do what Paul told the Thessalonians to do. We grieve but we don't grieve the same way as people who have no hope. We grieve with hope. We enjoin those two things together. We don't throw out the grief and hold on to the hope. No, no. We grieve with our hope. Friends, it's not wrong. It's not unfaithful to cry out against the evil in the world to God in prayer. There's a word for that. It's called lamentation. And it's through the process of lamenting that we discover what Jesus meant when he said on the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. The blessing doesn't come after the mourning with the comfort. No, the people who are mourning are blessed. It's in the morning. It's through the morning. It's during the morning that they're blessed. So lamentation is a way of praying that acknowledges our pain and that calls upon God to do something and it leads us through the darkness to the light. And we find this discipline at work in the book of Psalms. You might open your Bible to the book of Psalms here in just a moment. We're going to read from chapter 32. If you have your Bible handy at home, Psalm 32. The Psalms are the Bible's hymn book. Uh, it's an ancient collection of songs and, and poetic prayers, and they're written by various authors uh, from, from all kinds of different kind of circumstances. And Israel compiled these poems, and they actually use them as a guide to prayer. They use them as a tool to, to guide their, their worship life. To rein in the thoughts of their hearts, they would pray and they would sing these psalms in worship. And that's the great power of the psalms. The words of the original authors can speak beyond their time into, into our time, into our experience. And we can appropriate these words and we can, we can make these words our own and we can see ourselves in these psalms, and these psalms give expression to our feelings. And there's a great diversity of style and tone in the psalms. There's psalms for all sorts of occasions, psalms of praise and worship, psalms of lament, psalms 
of, of, of thanksgiving, psalms where, where there, there are vows being made to God, but there are 150 psalms in the Old Testament, and scholars say, some scholars say that there are, out of 150, 60 of them can be classified as psalms of lament. Now, compare that with our modern church hymnals today, and there's nowhere near that proportion of laments in there, if there are any at all in some hymnals. And that's a real shame because the psalms were meant to be used. See, lamentation is a discipline through which God's people can process their grief. It's a tool to help us cope with tragedy in healthy, godly ways because suffering is inevitable. And we're not just preaching this sermon because of the current crisis, but if, if, if you're not suffering now and you don't have a loved one who's, who's going through some sort of pain, it is inevitable. In Shakespeare's uh, Macbeth, it says, each new morn, a new widow mourns. A new widow howls, a new orphan's cry, new sorrows strike heaven upon the face. Each new morn, new widows howl. New orphans cry, new sorrows strike heaven upon the face. Suffering is tragic, but suffering is part of living in this broken world. Look at what David says in Psalm 32 in verse 10. Psalm 32 in verse 10, David says, Many are the sorrows of the wicked. Sometimes through wicked and rebellious choices, they, they, they bring sorrow into their own lives. But look at what David says in Psalm 34 in verse 19. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but Psalm 34 in verse 19 says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous. We can't escape pain. This is part of, of, of living as, as broken humans in a world broken with sin. Now, in the past, people understood this. In past generations, people understood life is nasty, it's brutish, and sometimes it's short. They, people knew famine, disease, war, they could sweep through their country at any time. But today, in our modern, uh, comfortable, high-tech, medically advanced, globally connected world, we read our history books and, and, and we say in our arrogance, and in our ignorance, our world will, would never allow something like that to happen. I know that's true for me. I, I've, I've said things like that. I remember back when 9-11 when happened. I mean, that, that shook my worldview. I said, oh, this is the world we're living in where things like this are possible. And I think we're finding that truth again today. And how foolish our thinking is. This is the world we're living in. How do God's people respond to that? Partly by lamenting it, acknowledging the reality of pain and giving it to God, doing what Peter said to do in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 7. Cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. Doing what the Apostle Paul said to do to the Philippians in Philippians 4 and verse 6. Be anxious for nothing, but pray about everything. Pray with thanksgiving in your heart, but let those supplications be made known to God. Lament. Go and give your petition to God. Ask God. And then through that process, that peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. What is lament? Lament is pouring out our pain. Lament gives voice to our frustration, to our complaints, to our confusion about why things are the way that they are. Look at Psalm, let's look at a couple of examples of this. Psalm 6 in verse 2. Psalm 6 in verse 2 says, Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am languishing. Heal me, O Lord, for my bones are troubled. Look at Psalm 10 in verse 1. It says, Why, O Lord, do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? How about chapter 13 in verse 1? How long, O Lord, do you 
Maybe you're praying that prayer. How long will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? And of course, who can forget the haunting words of Psalm 22? Words in which Jesus, as he is dying in anguish on the cross, reached back into history and pulled right into his experience and appropriated and fulfilled these words. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? So this is the language of emotion. This is giving expression. This is telling God how we feel in our pain. It's not merely complaining to God. It's, uh, you know, uh, Israel in the wilderness, they were complaining that God you know, wasn't feeding them. They, they, were, they were complaining about not having water, not having food, uh, you know, wandering around and getting lost. And they assumed the worst about God in the wilderness. At one point in Exodus chapter 17, they say, what have you brought us and our children out here to do? Do you, do you mean to kill us? You want to kill us out here, God? The very people that God rescued from Egyptian slavery provided for in the wilderness is guiding to a promised land that he would give to them. The very people that he loved and he made promises to paint him as the worst kind of villain. And their complaints in the wilderness were a way of testing God. And that's not what's happening here. Though the words in the Psalms of Lament are extremely raw and, and savage and, and biting because they're issuing forth from, from hearts that are in anguish. These are appeals to God based upon His character, based upon His covenant love. Look at Psalm 6 again. We looked at verse 2. He says in verse 3, My soul is also greatly troubled, but you, O Lord, how long? And then he appeals. Turn, O Lord, deliver my life. Save me for the sake of your steadfast love, your promised love. Save me on the basis that you made a promise, on your character. At chapter 10, we looked at verse 1, and then in chapter 10 and verse 2, he goes on to, to talk about these wicked people. How long are, are you going to stand far away and not answer my prayer, God? Look at these wicked people. They don't care about you. They're saying in verse 4 that there is no God. They're saying in verse 6, I shall not be moved. They're saying that, that God has forgotten. He doesn't see all the wicked things that I'm doing. And so then he calls upon God in verse 12. Arise, O Lord, O God, lift up your hand. Forget not the afflicted. Why does the wicked renounce God? He says in verse 14, you do see him. You do see that. For you note mischief and vexation, that you may take it into your hands. To you the helpless commits himself. You're a God who saves the afflicted, right? Look at chapter 25 and verse 6 and 7. 25 and verse 6 and 7. David says, Remember your mercy, O Lord because you're a merciful God, and your steadfast love. You're a God who keeps His promises, for they have been from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me, for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. So Israel in the wilderness was accusing God, was maligning His character, was painting Him as a villain, but the Psalms of Lament are in pain, but they're appealing to God based on confidence in His character, that He's a God who keeps His promises, that He's a God full of steadfast love. And that's why most of the Psalms of Lament come out in the light by the end. And so this is providing for us, lamentation, a pathway to our hope. Psalm 22 is a great example of that. It shifts in the middle of the psalm from a tone of abandonment to a victorious tone of, of, of deliverance. 
Psalm 13, which we read the first couple of verses a moment ago, shifts from, from saying how long, how long, how long, how long in verse 1 and 2 to the appeal in verse 3 and 4, and then he resolves to praise God in verse 5 and 6. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. Most of these psalms of lament end with a fresh assurance of God's deliverance and salvation. They don't try to explain the trouble. Instead, they provide assurance through the trouble. However, not all of them do that. Some psalms, in fact, go the other way. Look at Psalm 89. In Psalm 89, it starts out by celebrating the steadfast love of God, but by verse 38, everything's gone horribly wrong. But even Psalm 89, it ends hopefully enough, but look at the one before that, Psalm 88. It starts out in misery, and look how it ends in verse 19. It ends in darkness. My, my only companions, my only friends are darkness. Same thing with Psalm 39. It's another one that starts off with a, with a hopeful tone, but then it ends in despair. Look away from me that I may smile again before I depart and am no more. So what do we make of these psalms? The point of lament, then, is not just to, to act as an outlet for our frustration and our troubles and our loneliness and our inability to comprehend what's going on, nor is it just a bridge to bring us uh, you know, out of the darkness into light. They help us understand another great mystery of the Bible, and that's that God also laments. Some people don't understand that about God. They, they, they like to think about God as above all that. He's all-powerful and all-knowing, and so we have this picture of God, you know, sitting calmly in heaven, and he's just unaffected by the coronavirus. That's just not true. For instance, God, in Genesis chapter 6, when he looked down upon his beloved creatures, humanity, and they were tearing themselves apart with violent wickedness, the Bible says that he was grieved to his heart. Or further along in the Bible, God was absolutely devastated when his bride, his once faithful bride, the people of Israel, betrayed him with other gods. And then, of course, there's Jesus, who is God as a human being, staring at the tomb of his friend Lazarus and weeping and mourning there. So as we cry out to God in pain, even if our prayers don't resolve nicely, we can know that God is actually lamenting with us. And Paul, as he often does in this great chapter in Romans 8, pulls all of these ideas together. We won't look at all of it, but look at verse 22 and 23. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. The world is sick with sin, and it's groaning out in its pain. And not only the creation, but he makes it personal. We ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. And further on, he says, as you're praying, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we don't know what to pray for as we ought. Have you ever been in such pain? You just don't know how to word it. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us. How? With groanings too deep for words. So you've got the grief of the Father, the tears of the Son, the anguish of the Holy Spirit coming together in us as we voice our pain to Him. And He's interceding with groanings too deep for words or, or, or a pain that's so unbearable that it comes out in inarticulate sighs and, and moans. Have you ever had pain like that? Have you ever stop to consider what it would take for God himself to be in such pain that it left him speechless. Oh, God is suffering, and he's suffering right along with us, especially as we lament in prayer. Our job as God's people is not necessarily to explain 
what's happening and why it's happening and trying to decode current events. Rather, our vocation is to take our grief in the one hand, our Bible in the other, and give voice to the pain of the world through lament. Our job is to stand in that dangerous gap between heaven and earth and to simply weep with those who weep. Our job is to be that holy priesthood and represent the suffering of the world through our prayers. But remember, these are not cries of utter despair. We can cry out to God in hope because our pain is not random. The pain of creation is not random. Remember what Paul called it in Romans chapter 8. This is the pain of childbirth. Something new will emerge from this pain. And we are trusting that God will someday make things right. And we're appealing to God in our pain, just like the psalmist, based upon God's promise to do that. His covenant love, His steadfast love. And we can be confident in that love because that love was poured out to us, was made real and certain in the person of Jesus as He died on the cross for us, and as He was raised in victory, never to die again. And now, as Christians, alive in the Spirit, praying, as we cry out through that shared pain with God in lamentation, we become, even in your isolation, even in, in your loneliness, even in your own homes, as you cry out, you become human temples where God dwells within us to bring His healing love to bear upon the world. How does prayer change the world? Well, God knows the many thousands of ways He can collect our prayers and, and He can answer those prayers. But something else happens when, when you and I begin to pray this way and lament this way. We actually are getting in touch with the nerve center of creation and the present ugliness of our world. And we start recognizing that we're not the only people suffering here. And we're longing for that new creation. And it, it starts to come to birth even in our own lives in small and often hidden ways. Because our prayer if we're dedicated and devoted to praying this way, we'll actually change the way that we live. It gets us thinking differently about other people and new acts of kindness, new, new words of wisdom, and, and, and generosity, patience, compassion, sacrifice, all of these advanced signposts to the future that God is promising. But here they are happening in our world through us as we pray this way, and as we live this way. The narrative of the Bible, which has Jesus at its center, is not simply pointing to a trivial, happy ending where our suffering won't matter because it all works out in the end, and our suffering, present suffering now, just sort of gets swept under the cosmic rug and forgotten about. No, the narrative of the Bible is pointing to a new beginning when death will be swallowed up by life, when our ultimate salvation and our victory will be understood through this suffering. And so Paul says, the Spirit is bearing witness with our spirit that we're the children of God. And if we're children of God, that means we're heirs. We have an inheritance, that new creation, the, 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 the promise that will be fulfilled in the future. But We've got to suffer with Him, provided we suffer with Him in order that we may also be glorified with Him. Suffering precedes glory. Jesus taught us that as He died on the cross and told us to pick up our cross and follow Him. Suffering precedes glory, but then Paul gives us the hope, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. He says in another place that this, this suffering is producing in us a weight of glory far beyond all comparison. And perhaps through that suffering, we will understand a little bit of what Job understood 
Job says, I heard about you, God. I heard stories about you by the hearing of the ear. But now, as a result of going through this struggle and wrestling and lamentation and praying to you and holding on to my integrity and crying out to you and bearing my soul to you, through that process, I've come to a new understanding of you. Now my eye sees you. Well, how does this land with all of us? I want to end just by outlining very quickly. We won't read it. We don't have time to do so, but you can do it on your own time. Pick out a psalm of lament and pray through it. Here's Psalm 44. Here's Psalm 44. In the first eight verses, the psalmist addresses God and he recounts all the wonderful things that God has saved him from, in the, uh, the things he's done for him in the past, the ways that he's saved him. And we should do the same when we pray to God. Make a list. Describe how gracious God has been. That, this way we're affirming our trust in God. We're saying this is who you are, God. And that's going to act as the foundation, the basis for our appeal when we ask God to act. And then in verses 9 through 16, if you look at those verses, he's drawing the contrast between, hey, God, you've saved me in the past, but apparently now in the present, it feels like you're neglecting me. And if God, if you saved me before, why aren't you acting now? He's expressing how he's feeling. He's just being real with God there. But the point of these verses in 9 through 16 is that he refuses to let go. He refuses to turn away from God. He keeps his face set toward God, and he's going to work, he's going to wrestle with his emotions in that prayer. And then finally, in verse 26, he calls upon God to act. Rise up, he says, come to our help. Asking, uh, after asking, why am I suffering? Why do you hide your face? In verse 24. But he, he, he realizes that he's not being punished for his pain. Sometimes we bring our pain upon ourselves through sinful choices, but that's not the case here. And that's not the case with this virus. He says in verse 17 through 22, hey, look, you know, all this has come upon us, but it's not like we've forgotten about you. It's not like we broke your covenant. It's not like we're out there worshiping other gods. Why? And he hits upon an important discovery in verse 22. When the innocent suffer righteously, they do so for God's sake, for your sake, he says. For your sake, we are killed all the day long. He sees God's people as being caught up in this, in this war. And so pain is not always a punishment. Sometimes it's a battle scar. It's the price of loyalty to God while we're living in a world at war with God. It's not always a sign of God's neglect or alienation. It's the opposite. It's God showing solidarity with you. Remember, he's crying out with you, and it's pointing to that victory. And then, of course, Paul, in that beautiful chapter, Paul, of course, is living, uh, you know, uh, uh, hundreds of years after this, and he's got more pieces of the puzzle to work with. And he quotes verse 22, not with the despairing tone not with the more than defeated tone of Psalm 44, but with the conviction that in all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. You know, in this psalm, he says, awake, in verse 23, why are you sleeping? God may appear to be sleeping. He may appear to be inattentive to our pain, but behind the appearance is the reality. It's a bit like Jesus sleeping on that boat. And then the disciples come to him in the midst of the storm. Don't you even care? We're dying out here, Lord. And he gets up and rebukes the waves. Why did you doubt, you of little faith? Behind the appearance is the reality that God is actually crying out in pain right along with us. And of course, the last phrase of the psalm is made real in Jesus. Redeem us for the sake of your steadfast love. That's exactly what God has done for us in Jesus. He has fulfilled his promise of steadfast love to us by him dying on the cross to take our sins and raising him from the dead and exalting him to his right hand to rule over heaven and earth, to give us hope 
Would you pray with me as we end? Father God, we are so thankful to have your scripture to guide us in this time of trouble. Help us, God, to understand that we should just be real. We should be sincere in our prayers and just tell you how we feel. We know that you know how we feel. Help us to pray through as the psalmist, as Jesus did. Pray through our grief and our anguish, understanding that you're right there with us holding our hand through this time of darkness in isolation. But help us, Father, pray in hope for a new world to emerge out of this pain. We look forward to the day, Father, when this will be in the past, when you'll wipe away every tear, when you'll soothe our pain, and we can live with you forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to thank you so much for listening this morning. And we invite all of our members to tune in at 1130 for our Zoom meeting where we can worship together as best we can. Thank you.